Good afternoon and welcome to the Every Student Succeeds Act webinar. We have just a few reminders today. The slides will advance automatically throughout the presentation. Should you need technical assistance, click on the Help button. You are encouraged to submit a question at any time during today's presentation. by typing in the Ask a Question tab and clicking Submit. In order to stay within our time, we will not be able to answer all questions individually, but all questions will be reviewed to provide future guidance. If your screen freezes or the slides do not appear to be advancing as they should, please try exiting and restarting the session, as it may be an issue with your connectivity. I will now turn the call over to Brittany Miracle, Program Administrator in the Center for Accountability and Continuous Improvement at the Ohio Department of Education. Please go ahead, Brittany. Thank you. Welcome to our webinar today. This is the sixth in a series of webinars the department is hosting to engage with you regarding Ohio's ESSA plan. It is critical for us to get your feedback so Ohio can craft and submit a plan which reflects the needs of Ohio's students, educators, and communities. In order for this to happen, we must gather everyone's input. Today we are discussing homeless students and the McKinney-Vento Act. The newly passed Every Student Succeeds Act has created a renewed focus for states on measuring and reporting the academic performance of our most vulnerable students. Some of those are homeless. These new requirements will give states and districts detailed information to determine whether students are receiving the support necessary to be successful. Historically, the McKinney-Vento Homeless Children and Youth Program has guided the work to ensure that homeless students have equal access to the same high-quality educational opportunities as their non-homeless peers. States and local districts develop, review, and revise policies to remove barriers to the enrollment, attendance, and success in school that homeless children may experience. Districts may also provide homeless children and youth with the opportunity to meet the same challenging state content and state student performance standards to which all students are held. On October 1, 2016, the reauthorized McKinney-Vento Law for Homeless Students will take effect. The reauthorization of McKinney-Vento under the Every Student Succeeds Act emphasizes the need to move from basic compliance towards identification and comprehensive support for homeless students. The amendments to the law will likely require immediate changes in your district. Some of these changes may include expanded duties of your homeless liaison and changes in the services your district provides to homeless students. We want to gather your feedback to help us inform our state plan. Thank you for participating in our polling question that you see on your screen now. How many homeless students do you have in your district? 0 to 25, 26 to 50, 51 to 75, 76 to 100, or more than 100 homeless students? I'll give you a few seconds to answer. All right, just about 10 more seconds. <coughs> So the polling results show us that the majority of our districts have about 0 to 25 students they believe to be homeless, um, with just about 14% reporting over 100 homeless students in their districts. In the 2014-15 school year, more than 17,500 homeless students were reported in districts across the state. Over 50% of districts reported at least one homeless student. Students were reported homeless in every district typology rural, urban, suburban, and small town. Just over 1% of Ohio's student population in 2014-15 faced homelessness. Homeless students have many barriers to education. They are highly mobile, they often face trauma and mental health issues, and have fewer opportunities for enrichment. The identification of homeless students is important in order to be able to provide the appropriate supports and intervention. We have another poll to gather your feedback. Please answer the question you see on your screen. What is included in the definition of homeless? Please choose all that apply. Sharing housing with others, living in shelters, all unaccompanied youth, or living in a hotel motel. I'll give you a few seconds to respond. Great, 
take about 10 more seconds. All right, so the majority of people on the line believe that all that apply um, is part of the definition of homelessness. I will now turn it over to Susanna Whalen, Ohio State Homeless Education Coordinator, to discuss the definition of homelessness and other specific requirements related to homelessness under the ESSA law. Okay, thank you, Brittany. Identification of homelessness begins with the understanding of who is considered homeless. Students who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence are eligible for services under the McKinney-Vento law. This definition includes students who are sharing the housing of others due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or similar reasons. It applies to those living in motels, hotels, trailer parks, and campgrounds, those living in emergency or transitional shelters, Migratory students living in any of the above accommodations are also considered homeless. It's also important to note that unaccompanied youth may be considered homeless. However, they have to meet two qualifications, one of which is not in the care or custody of a parent or guardian, and also meet the definition of homeless. So in that poll question, that was kind of a trick. <laughs> Um, when we put the word all, um, it would be unaccompanied youth. Some unaccompanied youth are homeless, and there's a determination process. Um, the other part of the uh, definition includes those awaiting foster care, and it is important to note that that portion of the definition will be removed as of December 10th. There are several ways that districts can ensure that all homeless students are identified. This includes using uh, tools and strategies such as a housing questionnaire. This questionnaire can be included in all enrollment packets. Uh, and the questionnaire can include the McKinney-Vento rights on it as well. In this way, you're ensuring uh, that you're not singling out any student or family and also getting the rights of McKinney-Vento out to all. You, the districts can also use referral forms that are easily uh, available and easy to pass along to other district staff and community partners. Districts can also provide the local liaison's contact information on their website as well as on their posters that they, keep, uh, they post within the district and within the community. Districts can also uh, provide uh, materials in uh, language that is easily understood by both students and parents. And districts uh, are also charged with making sure that there's outreach and training for all school staff that focuses on the definition of homelessness, the signs of homelessness, the educational impact of being homeless, as well as steps to connect students and family to additional resources. Districts can also assist by uh, creating and developing interagency collaborations. Although homeless students are already required to be reported in EMIS, the data will now be used differently per ESSA. Homelessness is now a reported subgroup and will appear on the report card. We will show a graduation and achievement of we will show graduation and achievement of homeless students on the report card. Every district must have a McKinney-Vento liaison. The, li the liaison is the primary point of contact and should be the one to facilitate referrals and resources to ensure that students facing homelessness enroll in school and have the opportunity to succeed academically. The liaison serves as the intermediary for the student by coordinating services between school, community, and family. The liaison must be a person who has the time, training, and authority to adequately perform all duties. The liaison is responsible for ensuring identification, enrollment, record transfer, dispute resolution, outreach, and transportation. For more information regarding liaison responsibilities, please refer to the topic discussion guide.
Homeless youth move frequently, and maintaining a stable environment is critical to their educational success. Oftentimes, students may be the, school may be the only safe and stable aspect of the student's life when they are experiencing homelessness. To ensure stability, the child's school placement should be based on what is in the best interest of the child, based on student-centered factors. Students may stay in their school of origin, the school in which they were attending when they became homeless, or they may attend the public school in the attendance area in which they are temporarily housed. If it is decided to be in the best interest of the child to leave the school of origin, they must be immediately enrolled in the new school, and the new school must expeditiously facilitate the transfer of records from the school of origin. It's important to note that with the reauthorization, preschool is now included in the school of origin definition. The McKinney-Vento Act emphasizes the importance of school stability for homeless children and youth. Changing school multiple times significantly impedes a student's academic achievement and social emotional well-being. Therefore, the Act calls for districts to maintain students in their school of origin to promote that stability and positive educational outcomes, unless it's not in the student's best interest. In determining the best interest for a student, the district first must assume that remaining in the school of origin is in the child's best interest, unless that is contrary to the request of the child's parent, guardian, or of the unaccompanied youth. Preferences of the parent or guardian or unaccompanied youth should be considered first and foremost. Best interest determinations may include the impact of school mobility would have on the student's achievement, their health, and safety. Special thought should be given in any circumstances of a student with disabilities. Best interest determinations for students in high school should include course of study such as career tech or college credit plus, and completion of graduation requirements. Best interest decisions may also include the placement of siblings, how far the school is from, uh, how far the school of origin is from the family, where the family is currently being sheltered. If remaining in the school of origin is not in the best interest of a student, the student should be immediately enrolled in their new school, even if they're unable to provide records and documents normally required for enrollment. These documents and records inc may include transcripts, birth certificates, immunization records, proof of residency, or proof of guardianship. The enrolling school must facilitate the transfer of school records from the previous school. The expeditious transfer of records is important for educational stability because it allows for the school to schedule appropriate classes and organize interventions for students. The transfer of IEPs should be considered a priority. The transfer of records should not delay, be delayed by any unpaid fines or missed application periods. Transporting a student safely to and from school is a critical part of the educational stability. When a child is enrolled in a new school, the district should ensure transportation arrangements are made as quickly as possible. Students who are experiencing homelessness should not be absent from school due to a lack of transportation. If a child continues to live in the area served by the district in which the school of origin is located, the district must provide or arrange for the student's transportation to and from the school of origin. If the student continues his or her education in the school of origin but moves outside the district, the district of origin and the district of attendance area must agree on a method and share the responsibility and costs of providing that transportation to and from school. Districts should have in place inter-district agreements that address potential transportation issues that may arise when a student moves from one district to another. Such a plan allows for prompt transportation arrangements to be made. 
transportation must be provided to the school of origin until the end of the school year, even if the family finds permanent housing during that school year. Transportation costs should not be a consideration when making best interest determinations for that student. In order to provide a more in-depth look at all the changes in the law, four regional meetings have been planned. There will be a morning session dedicated for liaisons and other district personnel to, re, uh, to attend. Please look for the registration for those events in STARS. Thank you. Brittany? Thanks, Susanna. That's a lot of really good information on ensuring educational stability of our homeless youth. Once again, we ask that you participate in the poll question you see on your screen. What services does your district offer to students experiencing homelessness? Please choose all that apply. Just a few more seconds. Thank you for participating in our polling results. It does seem like our districts are providing services to our homeless youth, including cross-agency collaboration at 68% and communicating with the homeless liaison at 81%. That's great. The Every Student Succeeds Act has highlighted the importance of getting every student to school every day, including those experiencing homelessness. Homeless students have increased levels of mobility and absenteeism, which results in lower achievement and graduation rates and fewer opportunities for positive social-emotional development. Students facing homelessness often need day-to-day -day support and resources outside of the classroom in order to reach their academic potential. You can help your most vulnerable students by developing community partnerships to provide these additional resources and services to students. Also engaging parents, training all district staff on how to identify and serve homeless students, including cross-sector trainings such as trauma-informed care and promoting a positive school climate can all help with those day-to-day -day services and resources needed for your homeless students. We would now love to hear more from you. What is your experience with serving your students and your successes and challenges with your homeless students. Please use the chat function to weigh in. Before we get to your questions this afternoon, we would like to invite everyone to take the ESSA survey, which is now live on education.ohio.gov. In an effort to reach out to more Ohioans about these important issues, the department has created a survey to get feedback on several focus areas within ESSA including accountability measures, school improvement, educator quality, and student supports. Again, it is available until October 6th at education.ohio.gov, and we appreciate your feedback and comments. Brittany and Susanna, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. We're now going to uh, encourage the audience to submit questions through the chat function. If you'd like to submit a question, please do so by uh, clicking on the question box and entering your submission and then just hit submit and that will get to us. Due to uh, the time uh, this afternoon and the number of individuals on our call, we will not be able to answer all questions individually, but we'll answer as many as we can. Uh, to start off our questions, um, if, is it required for each school district to have a local liaison for homeless students? Yes, every school is charged, uh, every school that receives title funds is charged with naming a homeless liaison. Is that individual uh, vary in terms of the role in the district? For example, would a school counselor take over that role and who else in the district might uh, be involved in that? Right, so it, um, it would be in the best interest of the district to um, determine somebody who is readily available and easily accessible and approachable 
uh, to serve in that role. So a counselor would certainly meet that. Thank you. If a homeless child is placed in a temporary home outside of the district, but stays in the school of origin, who must provide transportation? So that would be an inter-district situation, and that would mean that the district, the school of origin, that district as well as where that child is temporarily residing, those two districts would uh, communicate through the liaison and then through the transportation to come up with a shared agreement and share in the costs as well. Thank you. Now this is an outside of the district question. If a student is in transitional housing outside of the school district for more than one school year, does the district still keep that student enrolled and provide transportation for as long as they are in the transitional housing? So um, transitional housing speaks to temporary still. And uh, we probably have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis if there are other details. But yes, um, the law does not speak to how long a family is homeless and they have the right to remain in the school of origin for as long as the homelessness exists. Can you talk about are, are there any different circumstances for transportation for a homeless student who is enrolled at a charter school? Um, so. The law says that um, the district or the charter school that it has to remove all barriers to education. So if transportation is an issue for that child, the charter school is charged with um, the transportation, um, and that's where they can look to uh, their dis you know, neighboring districts and things like that to assist in that if that's not a service they typically provide. Susanna, can you talk a little bit more about how to decide if unac unaccompanied youth are homeless, um, for example, age limit? So it's important to know that there is no age limit to unaccompanied youth. We typically think of them as being teenagers, but that's not the case. It can be any age. Um, the eligibility um, is dependent on the situation. So it, it first is defined as a child who's not in the care or custody of a parent or guardian and then also is homeless. So again, it, it typically is a case-specific situation, and I'd be happy to take an email or a phone call. There is an unaccompanied youth eligibility flow chart in the toolkit um, that's on the McKinney-Vento website that also is very helpful in making that determination. Depends on how long is the IEP. Yeah. Okay. Susanna, could you uh, touch upon uh, the requirements for foster care students in McKinney Vento? So currently, it's in the definition would be any child who's awaiting foster care is considered homeless. That will be out of the definition on December 10th, and the state is currently working uh, out a plan to assist with further foster care questions and concerns. And you discussed making decisions in the best interest of the student. Um, in terms of making those decisions, would that solely uh, reside with the liaison or is that uh, t the team at the school or district level making those decisions? Well, certainly the more people who can weigh in about a child's best interest, the better. Um, the liaison may be the person who forges the relationship with the family and gets the details of the situation and then certainly um, can collaborate with others at the school in order to help make that best interest determination. Thank you. Now, does a parent's request to remain in the school of origin supersede what has been determined to be in the student's best interest? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it is required that the district take um, the parent's uh, preference first and foremost into consideration. So the question's kind of difficult because somebody determined it wasn't in the best interest and it doesn't sound like it was the parent. So it really is uh, um, important that the liaison and the parent um, have a conversation about what is in the best interest. If the district is not thinking it is, um, 
a sensitive conversation and maybe even a checklist of pros and cons can be helpful in assisting um, to, to reach an agreement and an understanding of what truly is best for that child. Does a district, is a district required to transport a student who moves into another district if it has been determined that that move to the other district is in the best interest of the child? I'm sorry, there. I, we need some clarity with that. So is it, a, is, it has to be a homeless situation. So if a child moves outside of the district because they've lost their housing, they can go back to that school, what's called the school of origin, and that sounds like, again, an inter-district where we would need the neighboring district where they're staying to work with the uh, school of origin district to, to get the student to school successfully. <coughs> shared cost, shared responsibility. Does a homeless student get transportation to and from work as well as school? Uh, the requirement is for them to get where they need to be at the end of the day, whether that be a shelter, the hotel motel, or the residence where they're doubled up. Are there any requirements for preschool children that differ from those of school-age children? Uh, requirements as far as the district is charged with if there's a public preschool, and this isn't any different uh, with a reauthorization, but of um, getting a preschooler enrolled, if at all possible. The, the biggest change right now is that it, uh, the preschool will now be established as a school of origin. And also with that um, change in the definition, now uh, districts will be charged with transportation for them as well. Thank you very much. And it looks like we have time for a few more questions this afternoon. Yeah, this, um, this district writes about a child who is doubled up. Okay. Um, and if you could explain that too in your answer, when a child who is doubled up considered to be, or when, I apologize, when is a child who is doubled up considered to be in a regular residence? I'm sorry, Michael, can you say that again? Of course. Um, if you could address what doubled up means okay, at sure. large, but then when is a child who is doubled up considered to be in a regular residence? Okay, so doubled up is when a, a family loses their housing and needs to go to a residence that isn't their own um, in order to have a roof over their head. Okay, so that in, I'll give a scenario, a family loses a house through or their apartment because they're evicted and they have no place to go, so they go stay with uh, an aunt and uncle. So that's considered doubled up and it's a temporary situation. So when the doubled up situation is not considered homeless anymore, again, is a case-by-case -case, uh, specific determination that the liaison needs to make. A homelessness doesn't speak to how long the family's homeless. However, it's important when establishing that relationship with that family and making the original determination that they're doubled up because of a hardship or similar reason that they follow up with the family and determine um, what things have changed since their crises, um, how are they moving towards stability, and then a, a sensitive conversation to remind them that the mckinney Vento Law is designed for those who have a hardship and a crisis to get back on their feet. It's not designed to be um, used for anything other than that. So therefore, there are times when a doubled up situation can become fixed, regular, and adequate, but it is very case specific. Thank you very much, Susanna. Before we end today's call, Brittany, do you have any uh, closing comments? Yes, thank you, Michael. And thank you all for joining our webinar today on the McKinney-Vento Homeless Student Support. Please join us at our remaining ESSA webinars. The schedule is on your screen. Registration is available at education.ohio.gov backslash ESSA. Ohioans are also encouraged to participate in our series of regional meetings. Our set of meetings kicks off next week in Columbus. Please visit education.ohio.gov slash ESSA for a list of locations along with a link to register. We look forward to seeing you and continue our discussions. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for participating.